tonight, former Scotland rugby captain Stuart Hogg admits abusing his former partner for more than five years. He'll be sentenced later. Also making the headlines, condemnation of social media after horrific images were shared online following a fatal accident in Edinburgh. In sport, on the eve of Celtic's match against RB Leipzig, Brendan Rodgers says they must treat every game in the Champions League like a cup final. While frustrated Hibs boss David Gray laments what he calls a poor decision that cost them victory in the Premiership. And hip hippo hooray! Celebrations as Haggis, the baby hippo, is welcomed to Edinburgh Zoo. I'm Kellyanne Woodland. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. He's one of the biggest names in Scottish rugby, the former captain of the national team. But tonight, Stuart Hogg is waiting to find out his fate after admitting abusing his estranged wife over half a decade. The 32-year-old arrived at Selkirk Sheriff Court today, where he pleaded guilty to a single charge of domestic abuse. Katie Templeton-Knight was in court. In a hearing lasting around half an hour, Stuart Hogg admitted to swearing, shouting and acting in an aggressive way towards the mother of his four children. The ex-international rugby star from the Scottish borders pleaded guilty to one of the domestic abuse charges brought against him. Following the breakup of his marriage, Hogg admitted to sending his estranged wife more than 200 messages in the space of a few hours, as well as tracking her location using phone apps. He admitted that his behaviour, in his words, fell short of what was expected from him as a husband. The former Scotland captain made more than 100 appearances for his country and represented the British and Irish Lions. The 32-year-old has now retired from playing international rugby but has since signed for French team Montpellier. He'll be sentenced on the 5th of December. Katie Templeton Knight reporting there. Now, it was a horrendous accident in Edinburgh city centre on Saturday evening. A 74-year-old man killed after being hit by a coach. But what happened next, with gruesome images being shared on social media, has led to condemnation from the police who say it caused distress to the dead man's family. Our senior reporter Gordon Cree has the latest from the Cowgate. On Saturday night, the bars around here were packed. It was the weekend after Halloween and there'd been a Scotland rugby match at Murrayfield. Now, we understand that the man was hit by a coach at around 7.30. Several roads in the area were closed off and a large cordon put in place. But with so many people in the area and the prevalence of camera phones, a number of photos and videos with very graphic content were quickly shared on social media and instant messaging services. Now, the police say that caused distress to the victim's family and to people who inadvertently came across the images. A solicitor specialising in social media law has told us that the behaviour, while certainly distasteful, is unlikely to be criminal. Social media companies do have policies preventing this, this type of content, but of course someone has first to report it, and then it's a question of how quickly they can take it down. And uh, certainly in the case of X, you would also have the additional um, question someone has to make a judgment call at X as to whether it is excessively um, gory. Investigations into the circumstances of the incident continue. We're expecting some more details about the man who lost his life a bit later in the week. Gordon Cree, STV News, Edinburgh. Well, into other news tonight, and unpaid carers have told STV News the decision to not offer them the COVID booster this winter will be disastrous for the vulnerable people they look after and the NHS. More than 400 carers and organisations have signed a letter to the First Minister asking him to reverse the decision, saying it's a short-sighted money-saving exercise that will cost more in the long term. Here's our political reporter, Laura Alderman. 
This winter is a more worrying one than usual for Sue from Edinburgh. She's cared for her son Gareth for his entire life after he was born with serious health conditions. But she is also vulnerable and her daughter Wendy provides care for them both. For the first time since the pandemic, unpaid carers like Sue's daughter are not being offered the COVID booster vaccine. Frontline support workers are being given the COVID jab correctly. If you look at the definition of carer and all the different tasks we carry out, it is the same as a paid frontline support worker. Carers should be getting it as well. We do so much for the people we love and it doesn't get recognised. Like many carers, Sue doesn't have anyone to fall back on if her daughter was to become ill with COVID and they can't afford to pay for the jab privately. In my opinion, it's a money-saving exercise. It could end up costing them more in the long run, basically. To me, support and prevention is always cheaper than dealing with a crisis. And you could be getting lots of people, you know, sick and disabled people in a state of crisis, ending up in hospital because their carers can't support them. The Scottish Government says its decisions are guided by advice from the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, which has not recommended the booster for unpaid carers this winter. Carers saved in Scotland alone £13.1 billion a year. Um, quite frankly, the health and social care system wouldn't cope without them. Um, and that is the same um, whenever they become ill. Um, there's nobody there to replace them. And in addition, local authorities don't have plans in place to provide replacement care whenever they become ill. Meanwhile, the Scottish Government says it's boosting support for carers in other ways, introducing the new devolved carers support payment, which replaces carers allowance. But currently only one in 10 unpaid carers are actually eligible for this benefit. We would like to see them um, increase the amount for a start and look at some of the unfair eligibility criteria such as um, not being able to work full time and the earnings threshold which was also changed in the budget recently. For thousands of carers like Sue, an anxious winter awaits. Laura Alderman, STV News, Edinburgh. People smugglers should be treated like terrorists. That's the message from Prime Minister Keir Starmer today as he visited Glasgow to announce a boost in funding to tackle the gangs, enabling small boat crossings to the UK. Attending the Interpol General Assembly, the additional £75 million of funding will go towards the UK's new Border Security Command, creating a new immigration crime intelligence unit. Well, our reporter Vanessa Taff has been following this for us. And Vanessa, talk us through what's been discussed so far. Well, police chiefs from more than 200 countries arrived in Glasgow for Interpol's Global Security Conference here this week. Now, the Prime Minister used it as his chance to set out his plans to tackle the gangs and to put a stop to the rising numbers of small boats chock full of people arriving illegally on British shores. Now, he also used his speech to reset the UK's international policing relationship, which has taken a hit and been quite damaged since Brexit. Now, the Prime Minister Keir Starmer says he wants better cross-border cooperation and said that people putting excuse me, smugglers putting people on small boats should be treated as posing the same threat level as a terrorist. People smuggling should be viewed as a global security threat similar to terrorism. We've got to combine resources, share intelligence and tactics and tackle the problem upstream. And Vanessa, this is £75 million of funding. What are the plans for that? Well, this extra cash is going to go towards establishing staffing for a specialist unit and it'll also go towards state-of-the-art technology like drones. So the hopes really is that once these drones are in place and all these units, that the information and intelligence gathered from them will be shared and that smugglers could be arrested. Now, the Home Secretary was also in town today and she said that Glasgow is actually the perfect example of international policing working well together. One of Britain's most wanted men was jailed for leading a major drug gang responsible for importing tons of cocaine into this city in banana boxes from Ecuador. He was arrested in the Netherlands, extradited back to Scotland and sentenced to 20 years in prison in Glasgow High Court. International cooperation, work with Interpol, 
delivering results. Well, critics and opposition say that this plan won't actually make any difference to the illegal numbers of people coming here. More than 31,000 people have made illegal crossings this year so far. But of course, all of this comes at a huge financial, political and humanitarian cost. All right, Vanessa, thanks for bringing us up to date with that. Thank you. Now, a leading trade body is calling on the Scottish Government to increase the speed limit for heavy goods vehicles on Scottish trunk roads. The Road Haulage Association say the 40 mile per hour limit for HGVs is polluting and potentially risky. They say it should be aligned with the rest of Britain, which has a 50 mile per hour limit. Transport Scotland say they're undertaking a national speed management review. Gronjani Grehan has the details. This is one of the many roads across Scotland where lorry drivers are restricted to 40 miles per hour. But there are calls for an increase to the speed limit to be brought up to 50 in line with the rest of Britain. The Road Haulage Association says changes would be a benefit to everyone. It's fair to say that there's a different uh, driving experience um, than it used to be. Um, I, I realise there are other mitigating factors. The duelling is now um, pretty well on. Uh, and there was also the average speed cameras, which made a difference as well. But the overall experience, uh, not just from our members, but from speaking to uh, drivers of cars, was it was a more positive experience driving on the A9 uh, than it had previously been. At the moment, sections of the A9 is the only trunk road in Scotland which has a 50 mile per hour speed limit. Since the changes were introduced, Transport Scotland says the number of fatal and serious collisions and casualties have reduced between Perth and Inverness. Clive Mitchell owns a haulage company in Lawrence Kirk. It would save a bit of tailbacks. You can have quite a few frustrated car drivers tailed up behind you until they get a chance to get past. Or if it's a long stretch of road, you maybe have to pull in to let them pass, which is holding you up again. They're taking chances to pass you at points where they shouldn't be, but they're trying to get on as well. The Road Haulage Association says an increase to the speed limit for HGVs would reduce risky overtaking and bring down emissions as a result of more efficient fuel consumption. Transport Scotland says it's undertaking a national speed management review. Gronini Graham, STV News. A man has appeared in court charged with murder after the death of a woman in Town Head in Glasgow. The court heard James McCrindle allegedly struck Sandy Butler to the body with a knife or a similar implement last week. Ms Butler was found seriously injured in St Mungo Avenue and died. McCrindle made no plea to the murder charge. The leader of Inverclyde Council has been arrested and charged with domestic assault. Stephen McCabe, who is also charged with breach of the peace, has since been released and will appear in court at a later date. The Labour Party has suspended the six-year-old during the investigation. Two protesters who threw jam and porridge over a bust of Queen Victoria have been convicted of malicious mischief. Sean Martin and Hannah Taylor carried out the act at Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in March in protest over rising food insecurity. Sentencing was deferred. A 12-year-old girl is in hospital after falling down a waterfall in the Highlands. The Lochaber Mountain Rescue Team say they were called out on Friday night after the girl fell down Steel Gorge in Glen Nevis. She was stretchered to safety using a rope system and taken to Fort Williams Belford Hospital before being transferred to the Children's Hospital in Edinburgh. Now, it was once a fixture of the New Year's celebrations and now a new book has been published celebrating the Falkirk Children's Theatre and their popular Christmas pantomime. The performance was shown for 12 years here on STV. Ollie Dickinson has been to meet some of its stars. For more than three decades, the annual Falkirk Children's Pantomime was as much part of New Year's as fireworks and old Lang Syne. Performed at the Town Hall, they went from centre stage to the small screen in 1989, broadcast to the nation. There was nothing to compare to a children's theatre company of 128 to 15 year olds tackling, of all things, traditional Scottish pantomime. It was an overnight sensation and for the next 30 odd years, the house full sign went up. The hall where they once performed may have since been demolished, 
but the memories live on. Do you remember when my slipper didn't come off either? I remember it the slipper stuck incident. stuck on my foot. Joyce played Cinderella in the theatre's first performance. To have this feeling of excitement to put something together and then to actually go on stage and people to come and, and watch us was just, it, it was just one of the most special times in my life. For some, these early experiences, though, led to a career on stage in the West End. The night before the filming took place, the TV towers would start to be erected uh, and then the cameras, you know, and they arrived with the tracks are put down and, and then the excitement really started to, to build. But it was more excitement than nerves, I think. But it just added an extra layer of something very special. Now a new book, House Full, looks back on 30 years of theatre tales. And the phrase, someone should have written a book, always came up. And my wife convinced me that if anyone was ever going to write a book, it had to be me. And last year I sat down looking at a blank screen and thinking, right, here we go. For everyone involved in these famous pantos, the memories live on long after the curtain came down. Ollie Dickinson, STV News, Falkirk. All right, let's get all your sport now with the Raman. <laughs> STV Sport. Sponsored by the C.R. Smith Black Friday event. Good evening. Ahead of Celtic's Champions League match against RB Leipzig tomorrow night, Brendan Rodgers says they need to treat every game in the tournament like a cup final. Rodgers' side have four points from three matches. They secured a draw away to Atalanta in their last game. And the Parkhead boss believes they'll need to produce their A game if they are to get a result against a side which is second in the Bundesliga. Jamie Borthwick reports. Ready for the next big challenge. Celtic will welcome an RB Leipzig side which is desperate for Champions League points with the Germans describing this match as their cup final. You know, I'd mentioned that right at the beginning of this competition to our players. We have eight finals to see if we can get uh, into that playoff stage. They'll be obviously desperate to get points on the board. Um, but thankfully we are too. And uh, that, that'll should mean for a really, really fantastic game. Celtic put Aberdeen to the sword with a 6-0 thrashing in Saturday's League Cup semi-final. Earlier in their campaign, Brendan Rodgers' men suffered a 7-1 beating at the hands of Borussia Dortmund. But there's no notion of wanting to prove a point against fresh Bundesliga opposition. We want to win every game and that's always our mindset and that's always the mindset of Celtic also. And um, we are playing at home, so... Of course, we, we want to put in a good performance, and I think we, we will. So it's not really a revenge or something about a, a Bundesliga team at all. The goalless draw away to Atalanta last time out in this competition has restored confidence, and Rodgers wants to see his team replicate that resilience against another top-class opponent. At moments in games, you're going to have to defend, and you have to have that organisation and have that resilience to be able to do that. So I think that what Atalanta you know, proved to the players that at the very highest level, we can do that. But it really takes a big concentration, it takes a big commitment and it takes a togetherness. Celtic Park awaits another huge European night. Jamie Borthwick, STV Sport. Václav Czerny believes Rangers' 2-1 win over Motherwell in the League Cup semi-final at Hamden yesterday has boosted the players' confidence and says they are determined to retain the trophy when they face Celtic in the final. Their cup victory comes days after Rangers lost ground to the champions and Aberdeen in the Premiership. Nadim Bayrami's deflected strike in the 81st minute completed Rangers' second-half comeback against Motherwell to set up a final against Celtic next month. It's a big challenge, the biggest in Scotland, but that's also a good thing then. So it's a, it's a next step to take to, to win this League Cup again against them. Against the run of play, Motherwell took the lead midway through the first half through a former Ibrox favourite. Rangers fans made their feelings clear at the end of the first half. They saw a much improved performance from their team in the second half and the cup holders equalised in the 49th minute. And Dessars, he scores this time. 
and oh, how Rangers needed that. Like the equaliser, Václav Czerny played a key role in Rangers' winner, setting up by Rami. The Ibrox club will be back at Hampden on December the 15th. Who determined are the Rangers players to retain this trophy when the final comes? I think every chance you have to win a trophy, it's, it's um, for us as a players and all the stuff, it's, it's huge. The dream is uh, uh, there to, to, to win it again, definitely, and we're going we're gonna to go for it. Motherwell boss Stuart Kerrowell believes his team should have been awarded a foul in the build-up to Rangers' winner. The centre-back's manhandling our striker. He's trying to be honest, to stay on his feet and to try and retain the ball. Um, and it's the one that we all speak about sometimes, to let your team breathe. Do you have to fall down for it to be a foul? I think what Nick's done is allowed the game to, uh, to try and roll on. It's obviously my first semi-final um, in my career and I want to do as many more, especially with this club, so hopefully there's many more. It's obviously a massive achievement getting here in the first place, so we can't let this... We can't let this affect us in the season and hopefully we go again Saturday and pick up three points. Hearts have announced a loss of £1.2 million in the latest set of accounts. Failure to qualify to the group stage of European football last season, combined with investment on and off the pitch, has contributed to their first loss in nine years. The club generated turnover in excess of £20 million for the second year running. Hibs boss David Gray believes a late penalty award by VAR was the wrong call as his side fell to the bottom of the Premiership after conceding another late goal, this time in their 1-1 draw against Dundee United yesterday. Lewis Miller gave Hibs a first-half lead, but the victory slipped away when Mikola Kukarevic was shown a second yellow card in the 89th minute for Jersey pulling in the box. Sam Dobie converted the penalty. Meanwhile... Neil Critchley lauded Benny Beningami's impact as the midfielder set up the decisive goal for Hearts' first away win of the season. The 2-1 victory over St Johnson lifts them above Hibs. And Derek McInnes labelled his side's defending as unprofessional as Kilmarnock lost 3-2 at Dundee. That's despite being 2-0 up. St Mirren against Ross County was goalless. John McGinn is one of several players returning to the Scotland squad for the upcoming Nations League games against Croatia and Poland. There's a first call-up for Ipswich goalkeeper Kieran Slicker, while Jack Henry, Scott McKenna, Tommy Conway, Greg Taylor and Lauren Shankland are also back after injury. The Scots host Croatia a week on Friday before travelling to Warsaw the following week. Yeah, it's always good to get, get the players back. Uh, the a little bit more regular around the squad, but listen, the boys that came in last month did a did a good job for us as well. So, not pleased to have some of the boys back. Over the course of the the section, the, the games, the four games we've played, the performances have been pretty good. Uh, we, we haven't had the the points return that we wanted, but it was nice to get one point on the board, and hopefully this month we can add a few more. STV Sport. Sponsored by the C.R. Smith Black Friday event. And that is all your sport tonight. Tomorrow's sport comes from Celtic Park ahead of that Champions League match. Go ahead. All right, Raman. Always busy in sport. Thank you. OK, let's see how the weather is looking now with Sean. A dry start to the day will become increasingly splashy. TUI sponsors STV Weather. A very good evening to you. We hang on to quiet weather through this week and also very mild weather as well by day. Our temperatures well above where they should be for the time of year. This is just taking Glasgow, for example, but it's the same right across the country just now. Temperatures should be about 10, 11 degrees Celsius by day. They'll be up to about 15, maybe even 16 in a few spots this week. And I've taken this graph out to 15th and 16th. So the middle part of the month, those temperatures, yes, they come down, but just come down to average. So the temperatures around average to above average for the foreseeable and some other good news is that high pressure is going to stay by so no name storms for the foreseeable as well it looks as if it's going to be quite quiet through much of november a wee bit more changeable towards the end of the month and then we start to get the normal fluctuations between colder and milder weather but for the time being quiet and also mild a lot of cloud around during tonight a few light showers as well and really not much changing as we go into tomorrow we've got a southerly airflow so a lot of cloud across southern western parts 
but the cloud breaking a, a little bit across lights of Stirlingshire into parts of the Highlands, northern Argyll and Butte. So it's here we're most likely to see a little bit of brightness breaking through tomorrow afternoon. Highs up to about 11 or 12 degrees Celsius. Now the weather's staying quiet Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but because we've got that southerly airflow again around Ayrshire, Argyll and Butte, we'll always hang on to more cloud here and the risk of some light showers. Best of any brighter weather around central parts and highs in the middle of the week up to 15 or 16 degrees. Bye-bye. TUI sponsors STV Weather. And finally, Edinburgh Zoo has welcomed its newest arrival, Haggis the Hippo Calf. Baby Haggis was born last Wednesday to parents Otto and Gloria. Her zookeepers say she's doing well so far, but the Pygmy Hippo House will stay closed for the moment to allow them to keep a close eye on the family. There are only 2,500 of her species in the wild, so it's fair to say Haggis is an extra special addition to the zoo. And of course, if Haggis gets any siblings, they could be neeps and tatties. Anyway, from all of us here, enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.